All right. Uh, actually, I didn't know the Buenos Aires piece. Yeah. Uh, is there a story with that? Yeah. Um, <laughs> I think they're turning your mic on. <laughs> um, that was like one of the things. Patrick and I know each other pretty well. It's funny to learn something about Patrick even before we start the fireside <laughs> chat. <laughs> well, um, my uh, brother and I, we were uh, in college in Boston. Uh, and for those of you who spend time in Boston, and especially spend time in Boston in the winter, uh, it's sort of you know not number one on uh, you know the sort of uh, travel guides is where to spend your time. Uh, and so um, there were kind of a couple constraints. Uh, we we decided to kind of flee you know like uh, mig migratory birds uh, for um, for the winter months. And so we wanted somewhere that was on American time zones because we were sort of working with uh, you know a bunch of other folks in North America, um, and uh, we wanted somewhere not freezing. Uh, and it, it had to be somewhere cheap, um, and this was uh, this was 2010, uh, and you know college incomes, uh, and uh, a friend recommended Buenos Aires to us, and so we spent three or four weeks there building the first version of Stripe. Stripe's first payment was handled when we were in Buenos Aires, um, and uh, I don't know what fraction of you have been there, but it's an amazing, amazing place. Now one of my favorite cities. Been back since, uh, and so uh, you know if if ever you're sort of wondering, well, where should I go for four weeks to work on something? Highly recommend it. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, yeah, and I agree with Buenos Aires. And I've gone down there to, to uh, I actually did an Endeavor event down there uh, about 15 months ago. So uh, there you go. Uh, and that was the first time I'd ever been there. So um, uh, just on the kind of personal note, um, growing up in rural Ireland, how did that shape you? And then how did that launch into a global entrepreneurial career? Right. Um, well, I. I, I I often wonder sort of what the, um, what the I kind of ideal childhood looks like, right? I mean, I don't have kids, maybe I will someday, and sort of, you know, what, what's the right way to raise them? And I mean, especially out here in San Francisco, I mean, uh, uh, it's, uh, you know, the, the um, many people, the successful people out here who have kids, you know, it's, it's hyper-regimented, you, you know, you have your classes before school, then you go to school, then you have your after-school uh, classes, then you have your after-school after, after school classes, and, you know, and so on, and, you know, uh, uh, breaks are scheduled, you know, between 3.30 and 4 every second Sunday, um, uh, and it, it's this kind of regimen, and, uh, and, you know, I look at them like, holy shit. Uh, so back in Ireland, we grew up, like, we're literally surrounded by farms, uh, and, you know, this sounds like an exaggeration, I promise it's not, but um, I was really interested in the idea of the internet, but our house was so remote, we couldn't get a phone line uh, that would support the internet, um, and so instead of using the internet, I used to borrow books from the library about the internet. Like, man, this internet thing sounds great. <laughs> um, and, um, and I wanted to, like, learn to code, but um, I, we didn't have any, um, or I didn't have any either books or, or software to do that, and so uh, I'm dating myself here, but uh, if anyone remembers like Visual Basic for Applications in Microsoft Office, um, <laughs> I sort of taught myself to code in VBA, and so it was a lot of like word macros and stuff, and it was not glamorous. Um, and uh, anyways, it was this free-range childhood. Um, both of our parents, I'll say, uh, were, were entrepreneurs. Uh, dad ran a, uh, part of the reason we're in rural Ireland, dad ran a, a, a little 24-bedroom um, hotel. Um, we lived a couple miles away, uh, and then mom actually started, um, uh, you know, when I was born, she decided to kind of stop working, and then a couple of weeks after I was born, uh, she was like, "Well, this is boring. Um, this uh, <laughs> this kid doesn't do much." Uh, and so, um, and so she decided to start this little corporate training company. Uh, and so, um, uh, you know, John and I grew up with you know these two you know, entrepreneurs as our, as our parents. Uh, and you know, obviously, whatever your parents do, you just think it is normal, right? And so, like, if our parents have been astronauts, and we're like, well, just being an astronaut is like a normal thing, right? And so, our parents were entrepreneurs, that helped a lot. And so, when John and I used to, you know, play outside, um, you know, we would play like running a company um, because just that was a normal thing. Um, and uh, uh, anyway, so it was extremely free range. And then, you know, I finally sort of uh, we got the internet uh, when I was, um, I don't know, thirteen or fourteen. Actually, my, my first ever investment pitch was uh, I discovered there was this system where um, you could, uh, there was this, this German company uh, that had built these like satellite internet connections that, that cost 100 euro a month. And so I put together the investment memo uh, for our parents as to like why this was a good investment. <laughs> yeah. um, and uh, you know, they, they, pitching Sequoia or whatever is much easier compared to uh, <laughs> making this case. They were, they were quite skeptical at first, but we got it. It was amazing, uh, despite the you know, 2,000 millisecond latency. Um, and uh, then I really just fell down the internet rabbit hole uh, and uh, and you know, been here ever since. But the, the, my takeaway from it, I mm -hmm. guess, is you know uh, at the um, at the time in Ireland, you know, I felt sort of 
thousands of miles away from Silicon Valley and from the software industry and from entrepreneurship and all the rest. And like in some literal sense, I obviously was. But now looking back, um, I'm not sure that that's really a disadvantage at all. Um, you, you get much more used to kind of thinking for yourself rather than sort of flocking with the herd. Uh, you necessarily build a kind of you know, independence and resilience and you get a sort of differential perspective and all those things. And so, you know, um, uh, while in, you can get far more sort of stimulation, uh, perhaps uh, growing up somewhere like here, I'm not sure that on that it's better. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, no, it's, I think that's uh, well said. So let's now move to Stripe. Um, so uh, Stripe, um, amazing company, um, is in a sense uh, a bit of a counter of the classic entrepreneurial rule, which is go find where there's not competition, right? When you launch Stripe, right. it's like lots of payments companies. Yes, yes. <laughs> right. let, let, let's search, let's just, search for the most competitive market. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yes. So, so um, what was the opportunity that you saw, why were you convinced that that opportunity exists for you, given all of the competition? I mean, even you know, PayPal here, already located, et cetera. What made you think at that early, at that early day, like, no, actually, in fact, we can go build a behemoth here? Yeah, um, I think, um, well, I mean, the, the, the very literal answer is um, uh, we would, um, we, we got two very different kinds of responses when we were pitching Stripe early on. Um, we would pitch Stripe to somebody who had never had to manage or set up online payments, right? And they would say, why would you do that? There's already lots of systems, uh, eh. Um, <laughs> and then we would pitch someone who had actually had to do it firsthand themselves. They were like, thank God, finally, <laughs> right? And, and it was like incredibly kind of uh, bimodal. Um, and so I, I, I think, you know, Oddly, for an industry, you know, here in software, we all sort of um, uh, uh, extol, you know, product and, uh, you know, the importance of design and all those things. But weirdly, I think we sort of don't take it seriously enough. Um, and, uh, and, and I would say there, there are now, at least to me, three pretty striking examples of this, in fact, maybe even a fourth, um, of companies where it was obvious that the incumbent solutions are just not that good, despite being, you know, there being many versions of it. And then finally a good product comes along and you know, it's kind of up and to the right. And so it's not just Stripe. So Stripe is potentially one, but then you take Slack, million chat systems pre-Slack, yeah. Slack just comes along, does it much better, incredible growth trajectory. And in fact, it's in some ways better to have had a competitive market beforehand because the behavior has been adopted, people have learned, they want the product, how to use the product and so on. And sort of, you know, when you really get something substantially better, it's like you know, lighting a, a sort of dead, uh, uh, you know, dead firewood for it just like it really takes off. Um, and the third, of course, is Zoom, you know, uh, which, uh, which uh, just went public. Uh, same thing, you know, not the first or even the hundredth video conferencing system, but the behaviors have been adopted. You, do the, sort of, you implement the product in order to manage it better, and again, this incredible adoption curve. So I think this phenomenon is just uh, is, is oddly underrated for an industry that purports to care about product. And I think in many ways, a, I mean, the, the, the question ought to be, is it the product in fact much better? But if the product is in fact much better, if you're in a competitive space, that is in fact in many ways better. The, bu the buying behaviors are already built out. It's, very, it's miserable to teach an organization how to buy something they haven't bought before. The buying behaviors are built. The user kind of comprehension, uh, uh, the, the sort of uh, um, a manifestation of the need is already you know, apparent. Uh, and I think Stripe is just one of a set that falls into that category. And so let's, um, you know, Stripe started with two people. Now it's 1,500. Uh, 1900. 1900, outdated. <laughs> that happens in these blitz scaling companies. <laughs> um, and so, um, what were the key inflection points? And I'm going to want to walk through some of the specific, because one of the things I think people underappreciate about how boldly uh, Stripe and you guys think is, you know, Atlas and Stellar and a bunch of other things. But, like, what were some of the key inflection points by which Stripe, you know, started, the, the rocket ship took off? Um, I would actually say, um, uh, you know, in some sense, there were none. Um, uh, in that, uh, you know, I'll, I'll get back to the, the, the question in a second. But like, um, as you know, and I mean, as a lot of you here all know, um, to a large extent, um, you know, even in the companies that scale, you know, really rapidly, um, every day feels largely the same as the previous day. 
And maybe when you zoom out, you're like, man, you know, we've come a long way. But you know, every Thursday feels basically the same as the Wednesday, feels basically the same as the Tuesday. And on e each day, you know, every now and again, I'll meet someone like, man, you know, Stripe has come so far in the last two years. I'm like, I'm just glad to survive today. Um, <laughs> but um, uh, you know, you're, you're, you're sort of furiously scampering on the inside of the hamster wheel and uh, you know, spinning the plates and juggling the balls and on a unicycle, whatever you're like, uh, and you're, you're sort of trying to make it look natural and inevitable and easy. Um, and uh, and you know, I, I used to, um, um, I, I, I feel a bit misled, I guess, where um, uh, you know, I, I sort of knew, or at least kind of the world had told me that you know, if we started a company and if things didn't go well, uh, that um, uh, you know, the, that would be hard, right? Mm -hmm. And you'd be kind of you know, a bit miserable and exhausted and whatever else. But nobody told me, and I you know, really wish they had, is that even if things do go well, um, <laughs> you'll be exhausted and often miserable and things will be hard. <laughs> and like, it's actually kind of largely the same psychological outcome in either case. Um, well, and, there, is, uh, there is a consolation prize in one of the cases. Yeah, fine, right, right, right. They're, they're, they're not identical. But, but the day-to-day -day <laughs> sensation uh, is, like, like, basically, in either case, you're operating at the, um, at the ceiling of what you can possibly handle, right? Because, I mean, if you can handle more, you take that on, right? But, yes. but you're, you're just on the verge of you know, yes. fa falling off the, uh, the, the precipice of, in front of you. Um, and so as I look back on the, probably we started working on Stripe summer of 2010, uh, or actually a bit earlier, I guess, the, the, the uh, uh, winter of 2010, um, and, uh, and you know, now so we're on the order of nine years later, um, I would say, uh, rather than seeing it in terms of you know, discrete inflection points where we had this key inside and that key inside, whatever, it's um, each day just trying to make sure that things continue to work okay and feeling behind. Uh -huh. that, that, yep. That's the overall sensation. Um, and then, you know, in hindsight, certain things turned out to be key, uh, like uh, you know, the, um, the launch of Atlas or the launch of uh, Connect. Uh, or the launch of our billing product or radar, you know, whatever. But like at the time, um, you know, I, I, if you take um, uh, Atlas, for example, now Atlas, we know from having had the conversations, not only is Atlas, you know, like we're a significant fraction of all Delaware and corporations here in the US, but like it's been influential for other governments, right? I mean, we've talked to them and they're like, you well. You should describe Atlas. I'm not sure everyone will know it. Okay, sure. Yeah, good. Um, so Atlas is uh, sort of um, is a U.S. company in a box, right? Uh, when we, you know, we, we try to be a very user-focused, centric-led company, uh, and when we just we talk to international entrepreneurs, we ask, especially the successful ones, we ask, well, you know, how were you almost not successful? What almost prevented you from getting to where you are? We very frequently heard, well, you know, we're kind of, you know, we, we we tried and failed to get this started, sort of, you know, locally, or we. Um, we had to, I don't know, make several trips to the U.S. to get the company incorporated, and then you know the bank told us, you know, well, because we're not resident in the U.S., we can't even get a bank account, or you know, it's illegal to you know own a company if you're not based in the U.S. or whatever. And like, just nobody had built out the system and the process for international entrepreneurs. And so we decided to kind of. Um, there's this great line from Elting Morrison, who's kind of a military technologist, and he talks about how so much of innovation is just making standardized stuff that's been happening informally successfully for a long time. And so there's no kind of innovation in Atlas in some sense. Atlas, it's, it's just incorporating and getting a bank account in the US. But it's making standardized and accessible and universally available this thing that had been kind of happening piecemeal for a long time. And so for a couple hundred dollars, anybody could incorporate a Delaware company, you know, the exact same corporate structure that Facebook and Google and all the rest have, um, uh, can get access to a US bank account and sort of first class access to you know, kinds of infrastructure, tax and legal advice, a Stripe account, whatever else, right? So that, 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 that is Atlas. So we've now heard from governments elsewhere that you know, they've been looking at Atlas and figure out, well, how, you know, we, we should learn from that and figure out how do we make it easier to incorporate in our country, how do we better serve global entrepreneurs, everything else. But my point in bringing this up is like, we didn't, when, when we were creating Atlas, when we were having kind of those meetings, it felt like, um, you know, a, a uh, kind of um, silly slash implausible and small idea. Uh, and, uh, you know, when you're coming up with, Things I'm sure for all of your companies that have turned out post hoc to be big, like it, it, the um, no compelling soundtrack is playing in the background like in the movies, um, and nobody is you know better dressed than they are on a normal day, and you know chances are it's sandwiched between I don't know dealing with some customer problem and uh, and I don't know. Um, some other you know, minor disaster, and if someone's running late for a flight and someone else is dialing in, it's not a glamorous moment. Um, and, uh, and that was very much the case with everything we've done that has turned out exposed to be significant. 
what would you list as those as as those key things? I know it's ex post, yeah, yeah. right? But the part I'll of how you out. try to learn is you yeah, look yeah. back. Um, I mean, a lot of it, a lot of the things that I think have really kind of causally mattered actually are um, uh, are hires. The, the, those ones really do. Like, there's a, there's a question with, with a lot of our products. Even if we hadn't, like, I can remember the moment where we turned out to create or whatever. But like, if we hadn't done it at that moment, we'd hopefully have realized, you know, by being customer centric, that you know, a year later we'd have realized we should do it, right? I think the things that counterfactually really matter are actually hires. And I'll say, in fact, my experience, you know, with Stripe, we work with companies in you know, more than a hundred countries, uh, and I myself spend a lot of time with people building businesses uh, outside the U.S. And uh, you know, to the previous point, I think as an entrepreneur growing up outside the U.S. is especially today, probably now an advantage. Um, now, thanks to you know organizations like Endeavor and others, capital is way more available um, than uh, th than it's ever been. The place where I think there is actually you know s there are some real challenges, and, and where again I think there's been real moments for Stripe um, are, are around hires and especially kind of leadership hiring. Uh, and so you know some of the moments that kind of jump out to me, the hiring. I mean, th and it sounds so again um, you know unglamorous, but when you see things from the inside, the hiring of our of our chief business officer, uh, he was our sixth hire. Um, uh, he was our first non-engineer. Um, we, we actually, at the time, couldn't figure out what a non-engineer would do. Um, and, uh, and so I told the investor who introduced us that we weren't going to hire him because there's just nothing for a non-engineer to do. And he was like, trust me, I hire him. Uh, and, uh, and I will pay his salary if he doesn't work out. Uh, and so we're like, all right, fine. Hey, he turned out, that, that turned out to be a good decision. Um, and uh, and was quite pivotal. And you know, he, um, he, he got to Stripe, and you know, it turns out that um, not having a company before, not, Every way we'd set things up was fully optimal, um, and uh, uh, the, the, the hiring of our of our COO, um, uh, who uh, came to us uh, from Google, she'd been kind of running the self-driving car business before she joined Stripe. Um, no one at Stripe had ever seen scale before. She had, and there's all kinds of corners she could kind of uh, see around and so on. The hiring of our CFO and so on. And look, I know sitting in the audience, like, well, you know, put me to sleep. You know, the hiring of Stripe CFO was a big deal. Uh, I, I guess the the you know thing I try to you know. Um, in part, or to emphasize, uh, is that uh, you know, now being you know, almost 2,000 people into it, uh, I think it's actually those personnel decisions that ended up being the kind of key inflection points. And what are the hacks that you would say to other entrepreneurs about now having gone through that, not previously, not having appreciated the importance of ha hiring? Right. One of them, which we uh, can start with or get to later, is mm -hmm. what's the right kind of interactions with investors? Right, because this is one of the cases where an investor actually was useful, not just oh, the I see. money right, right, and so right. forth. Yes, yes. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, uh, good investors are great, um, tautologically, I suppose, but, uh, <laughs> but, but, but it really is true. Um, uh, and in terms of, um, well, okay, the, the, the question I ask all, I mean, uh, um, I'm sure you've heard before that you know, it, it really is meaningfully useful to separate companies into pre-product market fit, post-product market fit. I think for all of you here, you're, you're post-product market fit. And so the, the question I always ask first, and that I wish I had asked myself more or others had asked me more, uh, although in some cases they did and I just ignored them, um, uh, is uh, what is the structure of your leadership team? Um, and uh, and, and you know, what is the quality of those people? And I'm sure for most of you, and, and you know, certainly this is the case for me, like there was, there was never the case that kind of on the leadership team the people were bad, right? Um, the, the question is more, are they capable of uh, getting you to where you need to be in four years, in two years. Um, and, and, and that's a very high bar, right? And many fabulous people will not be capable of that. Uh, and you're really kind of shortchanging the organization by not insisting on that uh, potentially more than you are. Again, certainly more than Stripe did, and I, I, and, and I kind of wish we had. Um, and and you know, there's all kinds of heuristics you can use, you know, like, um, uh, is this person is this person so good that you would happily work for them? Um, uh, is, um, um, you know, uh, again, this question of not only can this person get you to where you need to be, but get you to where you need to be way faster than you think any reasonable person could? Um, is it, when this person disagrees with you, do you think it is as likely that you are wrong as it is that they are wrong? Um, that's one that is basically the case across our leadership team, um, but that I kind of value quite highly. Um, and uh, uh, I, think, I think it's, you know, again, Stripe with three years ago, uh, even though I felt like I was spending a lot of time in this, I should have spent even more. 
yeah, the disagreement point was one of the ones that I also use a heuristic, which is, will you learn from them? Right. Because if you're not going to learn from them, then yep. how is the acceleration going to happen? Yep. And when they disagree with you, you're, you're yeah. going to be inclined to listen. Totally. And, listen and, and like all, all of you guys are, are um, you're probably pretty disagreeable people. You know, you wouldn't have become entrepreneur, <laughs> entrepreneurs uh, if you weren't. And so you're necessarily the kind of person who when people disagree with you, like maybe you kind of, you, you've learned to be like nice and polite and you know, you smile or whatever, but like inwardly you're thinking, no. Um, and, um, uh, and so you actually do need to find a small group of people where, you know, again, wh when that disagreement is expressed, you're like, hmm, you're in your Bayesian prior shift a bit. So on investors, how should they uh, think about qualifying the right kind of investor? Yeah. And then what should they seek to shape that interaction to? Mm -hmm. Well, okay, so one thing I've learned is that um, good investors are good at detecting other good investors. Uh, and so there's this kind of an induction uh, thing where, uh, you know, if, if you can get one or two good investors, I actually lean quite heavily, both on their general, um, uh, you know, uh, kind of perception of reputation and also their sort of interviews, so to speak. I mean, I'm sure there'll be uh, a good people they'll stumble across, but um, I think just... Uh, Good investors spend more of their time dealing with investors than you do, or certainly, hopefully, that's the case. Um, uh, so, uh, and that's been quite useful for Stripe. Um, and then, second thing, and this is very obvious, but just kind of oddly, uh, I've met a surprising number of people who've kind of skipped over it, reference checks. Um, like, um, it is generally not difficult to figure out who the either mediocre or bad investors are. Uh, and um, uh, in I don't know, 90 plus percent of the cases where a company sort of overlooked that, it wasn't because they comprehensively referenced and you know just somehow that fact eluded them. Uh, I don't know they were just like smitten in the initial interactions, and you know from afar they had an amazing brand or whatever. Um, and uh, uh, you know if you, if you talk to kind of three or four uh, 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 sort of C CEOs or whatever they worked with in the past, you're going to get a pretty good sense. Yeah, no, I completely agree. Actually, one of the things that I do, and I actually think reference checking investors is really key. Um, frequently, before I will meet with someone, if it's an important thing, uh, possibly uh, investing, other kinds of things, I actually do light reference checks even before I meet the person. No, yeah, yeah. Yes. I, the, the, the earlier you do reference checks, the more efficient it is. Uh, yeah. Like, I, I like to tell people that we're, that we're interviewing that um, we'll have a quick kind of get to know you call, is this even a plausible fit, and let's just move to reference checks. Uh, yes. and, and you can reference us too. Um, uh, but, you know, it's way more efficient, like eight hours of, you know, meandering conversations and all that. <laughs> yes, yeah. exactly. Uh, and one of the things that, um, I'd say one of the times when I, I'd known that you were kind of one of these amazing world entrepreneurs that you had an extremely good sense of the intersection of technology and product market fit, um, you know, through years of interaction. But it was when we actually did that dinner where we were talking about Stellar mm. that I started realizing that you also were world class in thinking about the global systems, right? Like how do the new technologies come together? So what made you decide to do Stellar? Uh, is there anything that you would have told your younger self to do differently? Yeah, sure. Um, well, yeah, definitely, yeah, buy Bitcoin. And so, um, <laughs> so I remember when the Bitcoin paper came out, um, I, I stumbled upon it, um, and uh, this is back in 2010. Yeah, uh, yeah it, was, it was fall yeah. of 2010. Yep. Um, and uh, uh, I was like, man, this is super interesting and could be really important. And so I, I held a Bitcoin meetup in Palo Alto uh, and invited a bunch of folks. Um, and um, uh, I spent about $100, $150 on buying food for that meetup. And if I'd invested the $100 or $150 in Bitcoin, um, <laughs> that, that uh, would have been a much better financial decision. I did not, in fact, buy any Bitcoin. Um, but, but that mistake really stuck with me because, because that seemed pretty stupid, right? Like if, if I hadn't heard of Bitcoin, you know, back in 2010, entirely forgivable, right? And if I had heard of Bitcoin but thought the idea was stupid, you know, that might have been a misjudgment, but it was also kind of forgivable. But I made the worst mistake, I thought, where I, um, uh, I had heard of Bitcoin, I had thought it was a good idea, and then I just hadn't done anything. Uh, and, and I kind of really tried to reflect on sort of why that was. And I think at root why it was was because um, it seemed like a weird thing a weird thing. It just like didn't fit the existing model of the world. And so even though my logic uh, led me to think it was a good idea, it, it just seemed too strange. Um, 
And, uh, and, and again, any rational analysis, you're like, well, but it's so asymmetric if it works, if it fails, whatever. Uh, but I think somehow the kind of, um, we are so subconsciously, maybe even consciously predisposed to like not look stupid um, that, uh, that you know, we make these quite irrational decisions. And again, most of you here are probably much less susceptible to this than most people. Uh, and certainly I know that I'm like a pretty disagreeable person. I, like, I feel uncomfortable when I'm in the majority. Um, and yet, evidently, even I was like extremely uh, subject to this. So in that sense, it was kind of a powerful learning experience. And so then um, I, I, we came across this technology called Stellar. Hands up if you've heard of Stellar. Okay, yeah. So, Looks like you um, should explain it. Yeah, yeah exactly. So um, Stellar was created by uh, this guy, Jed McCaleb, who is a very early participant in the Bitcoin ecosystem. And he was trying to solve a couple of problems with Bitcoin technology. Uh, one, that uh, transaction clearing time you know, is quite slow. You have to wait for several block confirmations. So Stellar is sort of quasi-instant. Two, Bitcoin involves mining, which is you know, massively inefficient, maybe even terrible for the environment and so on. So he wanted sort of a more efficient consensus mechanism. And third, Bitcoin has the problem that you can't transact in a normal currency, right? You have to sort of convert into and out of Bitcoin and so on. And it wouldn't be cool if you could have these sort of um, you know, decentralized and uh, sort of... Um, you know, um, uh, uncentrally controllable aspects of, uh, of you know, Bitcoin, uh, but not have to use kind of a separate currency. So he created this thing called Stellar. It was working, like the technology existed, um, and, uh, uh, and, you know, it just seemed like, it seemed like Bitcoin in that, you know, probably going to fail, but if it's, I mean, it had very sound logic to it, and if it succeeded, it might be a really big deal. Uh, and so Stripe decided to contribute $3 million uh, to the Stellar Foundation back in 2013, maybe 14, I think it was. Um, and, uh, and we were lucky. Uh, that, you know, that financially has turned out to be a good bet. And you know, the, the, the uh, Stellars we received in return are now worth much more than our initial investment. But really, it was thinking, it was kind of trying to course correct from the mistake of, um, of well, I guess that, that I just described. And, and it's not about cryptocurrencies at all, of course. It's really about thinking sort of what should the world look like in 10 or 20 years? Um, uh, and even if that sort of sounds weird, uh, being willing to kind of have the courage of our convictions and to invest behind it. And I would say in some sense, kind of missing Bitcoin was also why we did Atlas. Uh, it's also why we're going to do, you know, two other products we're going to launch in the next year. Um, and it's, um, you know, trying to uh, up our willingness to, you know, look stupid. Yep, two things actually on that. One is um, uh, I described Wences Cazares, who's another uh, Endeavor person, as a board member and entrepreneur and uh, uh, generally high passion uh, entrepreneur, uh, as Bitcoin patient zero for Silicon Valley. <laughs> uh, and two is actually, by the way, I have a similar lesson um, from one of the things that I do when I uh, study international markets uh, for companies, uh, LinkedIn and others, is I'll actually meet with a curated group of local entrepreneurs because they're the best ones that are looking at future product market fit, and so totally. it gives me a sense. Yeah. So, you know, and actually, just this morning, we announced that uh, Stripe is, um, uh, we, we have four engineering hubs today, um, Dublin, Singapore, Seattle, and San Francisco. And this morning, we announced we're opening our fifth, and our fifth is remote. Um, uh, it's like in the cloud. Uh, and we're, we're going to hire, by the end of this year, more than 100 people not working out of any office. And over time, we're going to have sort of remote be a you know, peer office to, um, to you know, all of our sort of actual offices. And as far as I know, we're the first you know, major company, not that we're that major, but sort of major company to do this. I, I don't know of any other major company with sort of remote as kind of a, a co-equal pillar uh, with other parts of the organization. Um, and, and, you know, there's a reasonable chance we end up looking stupid, right? Uh, in that, like, uh, implicitly we're saying, you all are wrong and we are right. The, you know, Facebook, Google, Amazon, Microsoft, Apple, whatever, you know, you all don't know how to sort of uh, structure offices and we know better. You know, we're not literally saying that, of course, but, like, that's kind of the implicit uh, sort of calculus. Um, and, uh, and yet, when you think about, like, how the world is changing and, um, and where things are likely to be in 10 years, it just feels like the right logic. Uh, and, and again, even if we turn out to be wrong, which is very possible, it's still kind of the right expectation value bet. And I think, I mean, well, we have somebody from Microsoft here, um, but I think it's not so much the case that larger organizations don't believe in it, so much as it just feels a bit too weird 
Um, and we want to be sort of at the frontier of the weird curve. Yeah, we'll, we'll come back to that in two seconds. The thing I was going to uh, uh, double down on your learning lesson, because I had a similar one with Xiaomi. Mm -hmm. So I met Xiaomi when it was 1,000 people with Leisure, right, who would lecture me on how Silicon Valley entrepreneurs are lazy, <laughs> or a right. bunch of things. Yeah. And I was going, oh, it's really impressive and it's smart. And I didn't think to invest. I mean, I literally was right. just right. studying the China market. And I was like, and it was literally like, like uh, 12 to 18 months later, yes. I was like, oh, no. <laughs> yes, yes, uh, yes. Anyway, so I wanted to share that. Like, yep. But that kind of stupidity does happen to a number of us. Um, you can choose not to answer. Why does Microsoft uh, or well, not, not um, open like a remote office? Well, remote and I'm not trying to put you in the spot. Genuinely no, no, curious. No, 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 of course. Um, the um, so I don't know the answer because uh, 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 that would be a uh, a Satya and Amy yeah. and so forth conversation. Um, I mean, to some degree, once you get to Microsoft scale where you literally have offices in 150 countries. Right. Like, you, you kind of have offices everywhere, yeah, yeah. Right, right? right? So to go to remote from the offices, there mm -hmm. are still places, you know, right. that don't have an office in Antarctica, <laughs> you know, like, like that kind of stuff. But yes. you kind of like, it's not that far. Now, rural Ireland, you could get to, <laughs> right? Yep. Where, yep. where you have to go to Dublin, I think, for the, for the Microsoft office. Yes. Um, by the way, please don't open a remote office. Where we're hoping you know we can get a, a few years of alpha with uh, with our strategy. Well, I'm not going to ask you the next question uh, because I will reflect any of this obviously to Microsoft. But um, so part of uh, one of the things that you guys have also been pioneers on has been uh, how do we go to multi location? And as we talked about last week in one of the dinners we were at, it's now becoming a standard part of the uh, Silicon Valley, even very early stage, where you say, well, we can do two locations in order to grow talent in the right way and so forth. Yeah. So talk a little bit about uh, both, first, your initial, like, okay, we're going to stop hiring in San Francisco, right. and we're going to start hiring in these other places, right. what the logic of it is, how you made it work, sure. and then what the thing that you're hoping to prove in remote and what you can share on remote with a bunch of entrepreneurs. Yeah, right. Um, so uh, in Q1, for the first quarter uh, ever, Stripe hired more people outside of the Bay Area than in the Bay Area. Uh, and the sort of relative ratio there is going to shift only more towards uh, hiring outside of the Bay Area. Um, and that really, uh, there's a push and a pull uh, there. Uh, the push, which is significant, although I'd say probably still a minority, is when we survey our employees in the Bay Area, and look, this is a parochial concern, but it's here, I'm not going to spend too much time on it, but um, when we survey our employees in the Bay Area, a majority of them tell us they want to leave the Bay Area, right? Uh, and that's because the Bay Area has some kind of you know, messed up policies, very high cost of living, rapidly growing, and so just as an employee, you know, the company does well, very hard to just have a sort of normal, good life, buy a house, good you know, schools for your kids and so on here in the Bay Area. Very unfortunate, but, you know, is what it is. I don't, don't think it's going to change anytime soon. And so to a large degree, we're just kind of responding to kind of, you know, employee needs. And the bigger factor, though, I'd say is things really changed uh, over the last, you know, 10 or 15 years. And, you know, you all are much closer to it than, than I am. But um, it used to be the case that sort of technical knowledge and skill was sort of, substantially concentrated in the Bay Area, and it's just not true anymore. It's just not true. Um, I, I was in Eastern Europe a couple weeks ago. I was in Bucharest. I was in Warsaw. I was in Tallinn. Um, you know, there, there are fabulous engineers, every bit as good as those in the Bay Area in each of those places, and you know, basically everywhere else besides. Like, I think you can, I don't think you necessarily build a, um, you know, a great company anywhere. But you know, for the city of more than you know one or two million people, you probably have a pretty good chance. It's just been amazing diffusion of uh, you know, the the knowledge required, the culture, the um, all the kind of um, the, the the reagents for sort of software production. Um, you know, we, there's a uh, we bought a, a website uh, back about two years ago called Indie Hackers. Are any of you familiar with Indie Hackers? Yeah, okay. okay, so um, so Indie Hackers is this kind of community for you know, people starting small but sort of revenue generating businesses, um, and uh, and they now hold you know, about a meetup per day somewhere in the world. It's all kind of community organized, um, and that's th those meetups are very interesting because it's kind of a, a revealed sort of preference of uh, or kind of you know real time survey of just where are the people building you know interesting new things with with software, 
Um, and, uh, you know, there's people in Ann Arbor and Chicago and New York or whatever. But the vast majority of the meetups are not in places you associate in any way with technology entrepreneurship, but it's a very kind of powerful leading indicator of what the frontier looks like and sort of what the, what the world will, will you know, come to be like in the years ahead. In Stripe's office, we have these posters up of sort of a stack rank of uh, global GDP in 2030 uh, because, you know, sort of your mental models are largely sculpted by the stuff you read in books and, you know, it's already a couple of years old, but you read it. And so kind of your mental perception of sort of global GDP and the kind of the stack rank is probably, you know, nine years out of date. But like really you should be training your mental models on, you know, not only the current, but in fact what is going to be the case, because that's kind of what you're necessarily building for. And, and so as we look at that, things are going to be even more diffuse and uh, decentralized uh, than, they, than they are today. Uh, and so as we look at that, and then as we look at the improvement in the tooling, and you know, again, it's easy to forget, but like Zoom and Slack and Google Docs and Notion and Paper and you know, all these things, they were much worse back when we were starting Stripe. We started Stripe, we used frickin' IRC, um, and that was kind of the, the best tool available at the time. So I think there's been a huge shift in sort of the cultural capital uh, and, a, and a human capital. I think there's been a huge shift in the quality of the tooling. Uh, and I think the Bay Area has never been a less attractive place in some ways to, uh, to, you, know, to, to you know, be someone who works at one of these companies. And you know, that may be slightly unfortunate to the Bay Area, but it's fabulously uh, you know, uh, helpful for everywhere else in the world. It's probably net good for the world. And whenever, I, no matter where I go, you know, we, we um, um, uh, whether it's Australia or this trip I was on Eastern Europe, elsewhere in Europe, Southeast Asia, you know, we're, we're really building up our office in Singapore. Every city I go to, the, the really thing that's, the thing that's very striking to me is uh, you ask people, kind of, how's, how's the you know, entrepreneurship scene here? How are companies getting on? And people want to come back. Um, uh, it's you know, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, you had to go to the US or to Europe or to London or whatever to sort of you know, get a great job or to work at a great company. Uh, and that is increasingly no longer the case. People are excited to come home. They're excited to help the local ecosystems. They're excited to kind of uh, invest in a place where they grew up. Um, and I think it's a very powerful thing for the world. So what was the goal on the Eastern Europe trip? Did you learn anything in particular? Oh. Um, well, I, I try to travel a lot in general, um, and um, uh, I had uh, I, I'd never been to Poland or Romania or Estonia, uh, and those were all places where you know great companies were being built, um, uh, and um, like literally there there are unicorns in each of those places, uh, and it just, it just felt like a blind spot in my worldview, uh, and uh, you know I um, I, I want to have visited at least once I, frequently everywhere where great technology companies are being built. And did you see, did you get the visibility into the, <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. Um, uh, did you see the visibility of those uh, unicorns and companies through the use of Stripe? Oh, um, uh, no is the short answer uh, in that, um, you know, uh, Stripe helps us uh, see early stage companies, but you know, by the time they get to unicorn status, you know, they're, they're, they're sort of not hard to find. Um, I would say, um, I'd say Indie Hackers is probably our most helpful weather vane and bellwether and just kind of early indicator of where sort of um, where these places are taking off. Ah, um, nice. Because that, that, that they're the solo creators with nothing more than sort of a, an idea they're working on on the weekend. Or, I mean, it can be more serious than that, but sort of uh, the, the median Indie Hacker uh, isn't even working on their thing full time. Mm. But that, that, that is, that, that's where, you know, with Silicon Valley, People weren't working on their projects time in the beginning. It was, it was kind of the experimental side project. And so I think that's the leading indicator. Yeah, yeah. Well, that makes total sense. Uh, back to remote. Anything that you would share with entrepreneurs about building remote? The tooling was one thing you said. But right. it was like other kind of things to well, think about. Hands up if you have a remote team. OK, and ha I guess hands up if you don't. OK, so it seems like a majority of you are, are, are already doing this, uh, and you know, perhaps uh, ahead of us in this regard, I'd say the things we've learned are um, you need to invest in just like the, the capex of all of your conference rooms being VC uh, video equipped, right? Uh, you don't have to, but it's, it's an insane um, sort of, um, uh, you know, that's not the place to save money. Uh, it's a poor trade-off. Um, second, I think it's worth trying to invest in being a sort of written culture 
you know, that's not a binary thing, of course, but you can be kind of a written culture more or less. Uh, I think it, uh, I think actually it's good to be more a written culture, even if everyone's co-located. I think it's kind of necessary to be a quite written culture if you're distributed. Um, and then I guess the third thing is to treat, um, uh, to, to treat this as an explicit goal and to kind of survey people on, are we a good culture for people who are working remote? Uh, what are their top issues? To have like a, a, a site lead for the people who are working remote and so on, and just kind of have the feedback loop of where are we falling short, why, what are we gonna do about it, and you know, are those interventions uh, actually working? And I'd say that probably the, the single thing that sort of most improved things at Stripe was, was creating that feedback loop. Because, you know, for example, having video conferencing equipment in all the rooms, that, that's like a means to an end. Really what matters is the feedback loop. Yeah, yeah. no, that makes total sense. Do you have like an office head of remote? Yes. Ah, yep. done. That's like, I think that's, I don't think I've heard that before. I think it's a good idea. Yeah, it's, um, uh, we, um, uh, I, I think it's gonna be very important for us. Yeah, yeah. Um, so um, moving from Stripe to some other areas, technology, science, other things. Great. Um, you co-authored an article recently in The Atlantic, oh, Scientific yes. Progress Slowing Down. Sort of. <laughs> All right, so um, uh, I'm trying to spend too much time on this, but um, uh, you know, the most important thing in the world is uh, the, the rate of progress, right? Uh, in that sort of, uh, you know, if we were all, um, uh, like what's the difference between the world of today and the world of 1700? Uh, it's because we've discovered and invented an immense amount of sort of you know, new science and technology. And so we should be all obsessed with the questions of, well, how good are we at generating this progress? Are we getting better or worse? Is it getting faster or slower? You know, what could we do to generate more of it? What could we do to diffuse it more evenly around the world? All these questions, right? Weirdly, we're not obsessed with it. There's no academic field of you know, progress studies. Um, uh, there's, you know, there's some different people in different domains, and you know, the history of science or economics, whatever, who touch upon it, uh, but there, there's no central focus on the dynamics of progress, despite it being the most important thing. Um, so, um, uh, you know, uh, when I went to college, I sort of thought I would you know, maybe get into science, and obviously that didn't happen, but uh, I sort of remained kind of interested. Um, and uh, I realized with, with the guy Michael Milton, my co-author, there's something very strange going on in science that nobody talks about, uh, which is the number of people in the world who are scientists is growing exponentially, right? Uh, since, say, you know, the, the, the number of scientists working in the world has grown by about a factor of 100 since the Second World War. So 100x more scientists. About 100x more is being spent on science. You know, while, while people always um, argue for more funding of science, and, and you know, they're very well, uh, it's very plausible there should be, we have, in fact, come to spend about 100x more uh, uh, since the Second World War. And then third, the number of publications has increased by about a factor of 100, right? Uh, and so we're, we're kind of, by any kind of metric of you know, people or publications or whatever, we're just doing much more science. And so the obvious question is, um, you know, if somebody came to you inside one of your organizations and was like, well, I want to uh, sort of, uh, you know, grow the, um, I, want, I want 100x more people working on our mobile team. I mean, the obvious question is, I mean, Maybe, uh, but sort of what will the result of uh, putting 100x more people on the mobile team be? How will that change things for the business or the organization overall? I think the question for science is, well, as a result of that you know, order of 100x increase, are, are we getting 100x faster progress? Are we getting you know, 10x faster progress? Even 2x faster progress. So it might actually be a good trade even just for 2x faster progress because scientific progress is so valuable, which I really do believe. Um, and so we just tried to kind of look at this question a little bit. It's not easy to measure scientific progress, right? I mean, you can't kind of put it on a weight scales. You can't, um, uh, you know, there's no simple kind of dollar metric in the economy that corresponds to it. There's all these proxy metrics you can look at. Uh, like you can look at the, what economists call the total factor of productivity growth rate in the economy. Uh, you can look at how specific and the dynamics within them, or you could do uh, something that we did for this article, which is you can just ask scientists themselves. If they take various Nobel Prize winning discoveries and we ask them to kind of stack rank their importance, you can kind of get a proxy measure for like, you know, with all this increased investment, are we getting like way better Nobel Prize winning discoveries than we got back in, you know, the forlorn days of, you know, 70 years ago when we uh, invested much less. And no matter which metric you take, the conclusion is basically the same, that sort of the rate of scientific progress appears to be approximately constant, um, uh, that we're, we're not getting meaningfully faster progress today than we were 70 years ago. Now, you could take away two things from that. It could be the case 
but it's now just like 100x harder to generate scientific progress than it used to be. All the low-hanging fruit has been plucked. The, you know, the scientists of 70 years ago, they invented the easy ideas. Now you have to study for decades to you know, get to the frontier to just eke out one little tiny improvement. That could be true, and no doubt some of it is true. Or the alternative explanation would be actually somehow we're, kind of, we're, we're doing things worse. We're worse at sciencing than we were 70 years ago. Uh, and if you go talk to scientists, they'll certainly tell you it is not a whole lot of fun to be at the frontier today, and you know, most of your time is actually spent writing grants rather than doing science. Uh, and you know, if you can ask them, from your vantage point as a scientist, would you say that science works great? I've yet to meet a scientist who has kind of answered in the affirmative. And so I expect some of each of those stories are true. To whatever degree it's the latter, that we're bad at sciencing, we should be up in arms about it. That's like one of the most important things in the world, and again, that, that is upstream of so much of the rest of our progress, that we can just make the progress, the, excuse me, the process of generating knowledge, of generating progress be 30% better, that is going to improve the lives of millions and billions of people over the coming 50, 100, you know, thousand years, if we last that long. And so I think this is a question that we should be centrally focused on, kind of obsessed with as a society, but that I think we treat as, I don't know, an arcane question to do with, I don't know, how does my age work or something like that. Um, and uh, in writing this article, we we're trying to uh, shine a little bit more attention on this issue that I think is of uh, really profound importance. Since the article, has anything come up as a particular good thing possibly to do to... Yeah. Um, so, you know, it's interesting to think about, um, uh, you know, Endeavor and, uh, and Endeavor Catalyst, where I suspect that, um, you know, I suspect the Endeavor program... Um, has real counterfactual impact in that you know for for some of you maybe even if Endeavor didn't exist you know, maybe someone else would invest it or something but I'm also sure that for some of you if Inve Endeavor did not exist someone else wouldn't have funded you right uh, and there are almost certainly more entrepreneurs uh, and more successful companies in the world as a result of Endeavor's existence which is an amazing thing and I think everyone connected with Endeavor should be very proud of that fact um, and there's a somewhat analogous. Um, program uh, in, in, in science uh, uh, called uh, HHMI. Uh, the Howard Hughes Medical Institute searches for super high potential scientists and gives them uh, seven year grants uh, to go work on whatever they want. Um, unlike standard you know, NIH R01 grants, HHMI grants are not scoped to like a particular project. Um, and they're, they're, you know, a standard NIH grant is three years, HMI seven years, you can kind of take on something substantially more ambitious. And so this guy at MIT, Pierre Azoulay, an economist, went and sort of tried to do the analysis of, okay, if you take kind of HMI funded scientists and kind of identical non HMI funded scientists, you know, does it matter, right? Is there kind of counterfactual impact? And he found that HMI funded scientists are about twice as likely, I think it was 96%, more likely to produce a top 1% paper by the citation count. That seems to me like a pretty amazing effect size. Like it's the, it's the breakthroughs that matter, right? Uh, and you know, the HHMI is not changing a whole lot. These people are in the same universities, the same grad students, the same cultural environment, you know, the, the same constraints around them, the same IRBs, the same journals. All we're changing is the funding, and just there, we can get sort of this 2x improvement in propensity to produce a sort of breakthrough discovery. And so that, to me, suggests that the returns to intervention and perturbation of the system might be really high. It's not like we've tried a whole bunch of things and they've all you know, fallen flash. We tried this thing, and it worked amazingly well, right? Yes. Uh, and so I think that uh, sort of you know, more of this ought to be pursued. I completely agree, although the funny thing is I don't know how much of the uh, HHMI history you've looked at. But it all came from this tax hack. Totally, from yes, Howard yes, Hughes. yes, yes. <laughs> Howard Hughes, amazing guy as he was, did not set up HHMI, or kind of he did, but he didn't decide what to do with it. And it was actually um, uh, when he died, uh, the person set up to kind of administer it and to figure out what to do next, who was kind of uh, forward thinking enough to you know put in place all this apparatus, uh, and you know um, as beneficiaries of all the you know uh, the uh, scientists that HHMI has selected, who've done all kinds of fabulous work. We should be very grateful. Exactly. No, that, uh, I've studied it too, partially because of BioHub and ah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, exactly right. so the um, so if there was one area of science research that you would want to fund, what would that area be? Um, well, um, I have a friend, Mike, Michael Nilsson, um, again, co-authoring this article. He likes to say that almost every area in science has is wildly overfunded or underfunded. 
uh, very few areas are kind of funded to the right amount. And so my instinct would be to, um, uh, there's a guy, um, uh, there's a guy uh, in the UK, his name is Don Braben. Uh, sorry, I know you guys came for an entrepreneurship talk, but uh, it's going oh. in a different direction. There's a guy in the UK, Don Braben. Um, uh, he's, he's now quite old, but a wonderful guy. And in uh, 1980, he set up a thing at BP, the, the oil company, um, uh, called Venture Research. And BP gave him a tiny sliver of BP's R&D budget, about 1%. And so he was given 20 million pounds, not an enormous amount, certainly not by Silicon Valley standards, to invest over 10 years. Uh, so you know, re really a small budget in the scheme of things. And he had been a scientist himself, and he decided that he was going to search for kind of um, super talented people pursuing really iconoclastic ideas, right? Stuff that nobody else would consider funding them for, but where if it succeeded, it would really be a breakthrough. I told you, he would never reject somebody if they applied for funding. He would just say, I'm sorry, this is not venture research. I'm looking for things where if it succeeds, it's going to be transformative. And you know, we, maybe we need some incremental science as well, but I'm, I'm, I'm only funding people who are, if it works, going to be transformative. And of course, you know, the person has to be credible and plausible and all the rest. And he ended up funding, I think it was 24 projects, of which 16 ended up in fact being quite transformative. And you know, he published a book about this, going through each project. And so you can, you can judge for yourself as to whether he's kind of uh, grading overly generously. I don't think he is. Uh, the book is great. Um, uh, the book is called Scientific Freedom, incidentally. Um, and, uh, and many of the people he was funding uh, were pursuing areas and avenues that, again, just sounded really ignominious or irrelevant or implausible or whatever, but they themselves are really credible people. He gives you know, a specific example of a Nobel Prize winner who had like a particular idea he was absolutely convinced would be important, but nobody would fund him because he wasn't in the same area as you know, that in which he won his Nobel Prize. And so I guess if I were to uh, pursue you know, something like this myself, my bias would be to find excellent people doing something really ambitious in an area that everyone else thinks is a total backwater. And actually it was just um, uh, my... Um, um, uh, my, my girlfriend um, uh, works at the, the Salk Institute uh, down in, um, in San Diego, and uh, we, we'd been discussing there the, uh, the, the plant department. You know, the, the Salk Institute does a lot of amazing research, uh, and you know, you're not normally hearing a whole lot about the plant department, right? It's all about cancer and you know, neurodegenerative diseases and all the rest. Um, and you know, the, the plant department you know, has had kind of a hard scrabble existence for many years, trying to kind of eke out uh, uh, an ongoing existence. And they just announced, I think it was a $20 million grant um, led by um, the, uh, the, the TED organization. They have an affiliate fund um, that, that does some kind of uh, philanthropy. I think it was $20 million. Um, because when you think about the environment and the growing importance of things like carbon capture and carbon sequestration and so on, you know, we have these amazing nanotechnologies, um, uh, and not just nanotechnologies, but self-replicating nanotechnologies um, in, you know, in the form of plants uh, that might turn out to be sort of really pivotal you know, over the next hundred, hundred years of civilization. And so, you know, the people who are doing this plant research, well, you know, they really needed support and funding before they got to this juncture. I think the question is, you know, what, what, what's, the next, um, what's the next plant research? Yep. Uh... Now this actually, you reminded me in bringing up the scientific freedom of one of the questions that I had wanted to ask, which is, unlike many entrepreneurs, you do a lot of reading, right? Looking at books and so forth. So uh, two book questions, well, three questions. One is, why do you find that really important? Two is, which books would you think other entrepreneurs you would highly, most highly recommend, maybe recent? And then uh, three is, is there another book outside of that? You'd say, uh, it doesn't matter about entrepreneurship, but everyone should read it. Hmm. Um, all right. Um, okay, so why I read, um, that was actually easy. Alan Kay says that uh, computer science is like pop culture. Uh, and by that he means um, that we, we sort of have no sense of history, right? We just kind of, uh, we're ahistorical, we know kind of backwards looking perspective, we just sort of run around in sort of excited circles, you know, like, like three year olds playing soccer. You know, they, they sort of, they're just all like flock towards where the ball is. There's like, there's no strategy. Um, and I think sort of the software industry and computer science are kind of like that. Um, and I think it's actually both a strength and a weakness. It's great because even if the idea has failed five times before, Nobody even knows. We just like keep trying it. Um, but like eventually, it, it does in fact work. And so again, the, the ahistorical sense is actually, I think, a strength in some ways. But it's also a weakness because there are, 
you know, reasons perhaps to apply things that failed in the past that might be worth contemplating, and there's good ideas that nobody's implemented or executed upon yet. And so, um, you know, sort of if your challenge is to kind of how can you be, you know, insightful or have good ideas or good understanding, whatever, as far as I can tell, there are kind of two ways. One is you can, like, be really original and think really hard and, you know, be really brilliant, or you can cheat and you just read lots of books um, and, you know, coast off their perspective. Um, and uh, uh, and I, I think the uh, the latter is way more efficient and you know, much more achievable for me than the former. Um, so so that's why to read. Um, uh, and I guess a corollary of that, which I also kind of agree with and, and believe, is you should probably bias towards reading stuff that the people around you aren't reading because you're going to pick up the cultural perspective and all the rest, you know, of the things the people around you are reading. And so you should probably seek decorrelation and read stuff that that they aren't. Um, and in particular, may time shift backwards because that stuff tends to be comparatively, you know, under um, uh, under invested in. Um, as to kind of uh, uh, what to read, um, you know, um, honestly, I would say whatever um, whatever interests you, and when there's an area of interest uh, to just be kind of. Um, uh, you know, to just go wild and jump around between a whole bunch of different books in that vein, in that area. The particular thing I've been interested in over the past couple of weeks is, um, I've, been, I've read all of or most of like 15 different books in it, is um, quickly executed engineering projects. So um, in 2000, uh, New York decided to build the Second Avenue subway. Um, 2019, three subway stations are open, 19 years later. Uh, like, huh, well, I guess it's a building a subway. That's very difficult, right? And so, fair, I understand. But then you're like, well, hang on a second. And in 1900, um, uh, the, the New York decided to construct its first subway. Um, and 4.7 years later, 28 stations opened. And like, that's just very strange. Like, we're, 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 we're used to things getting better, faster, cheaper, whatever. And it, it's like, I mean, you know, did, did we lose some stuff about how to build subways? Or like, did, did, um, did 1900 have better subway building technology? Like, it just, that, it's, very, it's honestly very strange. Uh, and so I've been trying to figure out, well, like, you know, it, does this phenomenon exist more broadly? And you know, what are the kind of bounds of it? Um, and so the Empire State Building was built in 410 days, start to finish. Um, and again, that's very peculiar. That, that's not how long it takes to build a skyscraper today. And you're like, well, OK, fine. Um, you know, maybe they're just really reckless, right? A ton of people died. And so I, I checked that. Um, fewer people died per kind of construction capita than died building the Twin Towers uh, or than building the Bay Bridge. And so it wasn't that they were just, you know, reckless with, with human life. And so again, it's peculiar. Um, the first ever jet aircraft, the first ever jet aircraft was, the, um, was built by Lockheed Martin. And uh, it was built from kind of commission of contract to flight of the, of the aircraft in 143 days. Um, uh, in fact, if you look up there, you can't quite see because it's just around the bend, but that's Marin up there, um, the, the county of Marin, and there's a, a, a little place up there called Marin City. Um, and um, in 1942, uh, Bechtel Shipbuilding Company, Bechtel is a company uh, headquartered here in San Francisco, one of the kind of great industrial companies of, of the U.S., um, they received a telegram uh, uh, the War Department uh, requesting that they build more ships. They didn't have any more shipbuilding capacity. You know, all their shipyards were full. And so uh, they um, were like, well, man, you know, what, what do we do? And so they were like, well, I guess we just got to build another shipyard. Not a small thing. Um, and there was no more space in San Francisco or in Oakland. So they're like, well, I guess we'll go up to Marin and build a shipyard up in Marin. Uh, and then, you know, okay, fine, we can build a shipyard. But then we got to hire all the people and build the quarters for the workers and, I don't know, find talented people who can design ships and build the ship and all the rest. From when they got that telegram, I think it was uh, March 2nd, 1942, to when the first ship set sail uh, was uh, 187 days, I believe. Um, acquiring the land, building the shipyard, hiring the workers, feeding the workers, building the ship, um, 187 days. Um, so anyway, I've become very interested in sort of this question of like, what was true then that's not true now? And again, a lot of the easy explanations you might offer, like, well, it was war. Uh, Disneyland was built in 366 days. No, no war going on there, um, uh, or at least not with guns. Um, and um, anyway, so, so I've been kind of going uh, deep into that scene. But I think kind of motivation and interest matters a lot. And so I would just kind of pursue, um, you know, uh, I, would, I would flit across things that are of interest. Don't worry about finishing them. Just, you know, the, the book is there to be read, you know, forwards, backwards, you know, not in order, all the rest. Um, and that, sorry, what was your last question? 
Well, it's just, if there's a particular one on entrepreneurship, but oh, by the way, just to say, yeah, yeah. A, I actually, when I get, the one reason I still really like physical books is actually what I do is I first open randomly to a set of different yeah, sections. Yeah, I highly recommend. Yeah. In, or, in, or in order to, to, in order to say, okay, should I read more of this book? Yes. Yeah, totally. Take, take yeah. a core sample. Um, yes. It's like quality, quality testing. Um, so, um, so what you should read, um, I really like um, Masters of Doom um, uh, about the history of ID software, uh, an amazingly innovative technology company. Uh, they created Doom and Quake, uh, two of the most technically sophisticated games, or the most technically sophisticated games that have been created uh, at that time. Uh, John Carmack was the founder. You know, John, of course, is still very active uh, in the industry, now working on VR. Uh, and it is a wild tale. Um, and uh, and again, this um, this combination of like it, it reads like a thriller, and it's about the repeated creation of all these amazing technological breakthroughs. Uh, I read it in literally a single sitting. So now you can tell why Patrick is not only one of my favorite entrepreneurs, but one of my favorite people. Let's thank him. Yeah. <laughs>